counseling for odl learners my name is anshuman jena and i am the moderator of this session we are conducting this session on zoom at the same time it is being live streamed on the official youtube channel of odisha state open university thank you all for being super active on the discussion forum in the in the first live session we had conducted thank you all for being super active on the discussion forum in the first live session we had discussed about the growth and evolution of open and distance learning and the characteristics of 21st century learner the template of today's session remains the same our distinguished speaker will deliver the talk for about 40 to 45 minutes then we'll get into the question and answer session we'll try to take up as many questions as we can in the due course of our interaction please use the chat option to share your questions we'll also take questions from our youtube participants so please do not hesitate to ask questions and towards the end of the session we will share the online feedback link with all of you please provide us with your valuable feedback so that we know what you liked or disliked about this session and what are the areas of improvements for us today's session is based on the content of the second week of the course the topic of this session is online learning skills and strategies and to discuss this we have dr ajit kumar mishra with us Dr Misra holds a doctorate degree in African American Studies from Banaras Hindu University in India. He is currently working as an associate professor in the Department of Humanistic Studies at the Indian Institute of Management sorry Indian Institute of Technology Banaras Hindu University. His research interests include narrative studies, visual culture, research communication health communication and humanistic communication he has been an institutional and corporate trainer in the area of research communication management communication and health communication he has developed a mooc on literature and coping skills in association with nptel ministry of education government of india he is also developing a mock on essential life skills for semka he finds it thoroughly enjoyable when he is interacting with the inter, uh, he he has conducted scores of technical sessions in research writing pedagogical strategies and research communication in fdps and workshop thank you sir for accepting our invitation to deliver this talk we are all eagerly waiting to listen and interact with you over to you sir you may please share your screen and start addressing us uh, thank you very much uh, uh, dr jena before i start uh, please let me know uh, if i sound clearly to all of you out there yes Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Pani Grahi. Very good afternoon, and uh, hello to everyone. Good afternoon, uh, all the participants. Uh, uh, we are going to take up uh, a few very interesting developments that are happening in the world of uh, online and distance learning, and I must congratulate uh, Odisha Open University. Uh, and uh, semka congress of learning for coming together uh, to bring this course up because it's going to be extremely useful for all those practitioners of online and distance learning and teaching of course uh, so i'm going to talk about a few uh, things that are uh, related to this particular field and 
which which can also show us a new direction uh, in which we can move or we, we can direct our energy our efforts in time to come so that we, we can in fact to make the best of this particular opportunity that we call digital learning and we all know digital learning is here to stay and uh, although it was very, very unfortunate that it came it cropped up uh, in the wake of a pandemic but it's here to stay let's accept the fact and so sooner you accept this fact it will be easier for us to take note of this development and make the most out of it so give me a few seconds so that i can share my screen with you and i will start I think the screen is visible to all of you now. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll speak as uh, the moderator of this session, and Dr. Jenna has uh, told you all that. I'll be speaking for 40, 45 minutes. Uh, um, I, I would like to restrict my speech, my talk to 40 minutes so that we get some more time for discussion. Now we can take uh, questions, we can take uh, your observations, your comments, your valuable inputs, so that we can make this session enriching. Uh, online learning, uh, you all are participating in this MOOC, that is uh, Academic Council for ODL. So online learning is uh, everywhere. Everywhere we turn around, we turn our eyes, so we find online learning. Everyone is talking about online learning in some way or the other. So there are a few important skills and strategies uh, that are associated with online learning uh, because without those skills, it will be very difficult for us to catch up with the need, the demand of this particular thing, this particular development, because there's a huge difference between face-to-face -face learning and online learning because of the virtual element that is embedded into the very idea of online or distance or digital learning. So how do we take care of this element that is called the virtual element? So until and unless we take care of this virtual element, it will be very difficult for us to take care of the needs or the demands of online learning. And this is one big reason why most people find it interesting in the beginning and as time passes, the interest level drops. And by the time a MOOC comes to its conclusion or the final week, a large number of participants, in fact, leave the MOOC. And a very few people ultimately complete the MOOCs or any online uh, program for that matter. And this, this has been uh, worrying, this has been bothering, uh, educators, uh, developers of uh, such uh, programs for quite some time now. So we'll take a look at uh, some possible reasons from a different perspective so that we, we get to know why it is so. Before I start, uh, uh, let me uh, confirm it with the moderator that most of the participants are in fact uh, online trainers. Uh, am, I, am I right in my guess? Yes. Are they involved in some kind of online teaching, online training, development of online content? Yes, either they are actively involved or they aspire to be involved. Okay, that's great. That's great. And that means uh, we have a homogeneous group. So that makes it better. So every time we, we think of uh, these uh, strategies and skills, we actually... Uh, come to this particular thing, or these things. The first of which is time management skill. Most often, I mean, invariably of whatever course you are participating in, whatever course uh, you, you have been associated with, you generally come across this particular injunction, time management. 
So people generally ask you to manage your time in such a manner so that you can pace your learning process. You can match the speed of that course because we all know that most of these online courses, MOOCs, are generally scheduled for a certain period and then thereafter you have to take the assignments and then you have to take the final examination for certification programs. There are uh, a few MOOCs that are self-paced ones and those self-paced MOOCs are slightly more popular than these pre-scheduled MOOCs. But when it comes to uh, completing MOOCs, the rate is almost the same. Whether it's a scheduled, well-defined, well-scheduled MOOC or online program, or it's a self-paced uh, MOOC or online program. Because if we get less time, we get bothered, we are worried, we develop some kind of anxiety and we do not exactly know how to uh, you know, catch up with the demand of that particular schedule. On the other hand, if we get less time, uh, uh, more and more time, in the case of self-paced MOOCs, we tend to become slack. So many studies have uh, given us evidence that when it comes to self-paced MOOCs, people generally say that there is always a tomorrow. So I can take care of this segment tomorrow because it's a self-paced MOOC. So there's no problem at all. So whether it is uh, a pre-scheduled MOOC or self-paced MOOC, most people generally talk about time management skills because you cannot procrastinate when it comes to completing MOOCs. So you need to take care of time. The second is uh, people generally encourage the participants to be information sponge. That means you need to suck in as much information as you can. And how do you do that? I mean, uh, by actively participating in online discussion forums, uh, you know, being part of uh, smaller discussion groups, and uh, uh, participating in jam board events and a variety of other things in which you get an opportunity to participate in discussions. So people generally encourage you to be information sponge when it comes to online discussions. That means you take care of each and every thread, each and every question that people raise. If you, if you want to verify, if you want to check, how far you have progressed, how well you have learned a certain material, a certain, um, certain segment, uh, be an information sponge. So this is the second thing. Uh, this is the second skill that people generally emphasize when it comes to online learning, apart from the time management skill. And then we come to uh, this particular skill, because most often people do not uh, raise questions. They do not ask questions. Because I think it's, it's up to somebody else to do that. I'll just uh, sit quietly or I'll, I'll follow quietly and see what kind of questions people raise. And I'll try to find the questions that I actually want to ask. And generally that happens. There is somebody else who asks questions for you. So most often people try to find matching questions in the questions asked by others. But it's, it's a better skill for somebody, an online learner, to know how to ask the right kind of questions. And that's exactly a very important skill that most educators or developers of online content or material emphasize. So if you know how to ask the right kind of questions, now what are the right kind of questions? So what exactly do you want to do? Are you, are you going to extract some information from the participants, from the instructors, from the material, or you're going to extend it. So there's a huge difference between your approach, your attitude. If you can extend that particular discussion yet further, because no content, no material, no information is complete in itself. There's always a next level. So if you can take it to next level, that means you are adding, you're contributing to that particular MOOC material or MOOC content, you're enriching that. So most people generally 
emphasize this particular skill as well. And then uh, to the fourth very important skill, that is interpersonal skill, learning to make friends with fellow students, which is of course a challenge when it comes to online courses, especially MOOCs and distance learning programs, because you generally do not get to meet people, you do not get enough time uh, to interact with people who are also taking the same course, but it's, it's a skill that is important in all learning environments, because if you do not develop the right kind of interpersonal skills, then it's not going to be a community learning experience for you. It's going to be an isolated individual learning experience for you. And we all know that no individual is complete in oneself. So I may be uh, very, very focused. I may be very, very eager and self-determined, self-motivated to learn a lot of things in this world, unless I take myself to other people, unless I get my knowledge, my information verified by people around me, so it will not be possible for me to gauge or to measure the level of learning that I have achieved. So interpersonal skills have no substitute one has to develop interpersonal skills, whether it's in the face-to-face -face mode or in the online mode. So most people emphasize these skills, starting with time management skills, moving to uh, information sponge skill, and then learning to ask the right kind of questions, and then finally developing some good, very good interpersonal skills. So discussion forums actually offer a wonderful opportunity for people to know how people approach a certain subject, a certain material or content. And that's exactly where you can find somebody who also thinks alike. And you can also find somebody who thinks differently. And you can make friends with both of them. You can just drop a message, send an, uh, an email, or a message privately to the person and then try to know what other areas interest the same person. And that is how you can, you can develop your interpersonal skills and you can develop some kind of association with other participants in that particular course. So this, these are some of the most important online learning skills and strategies most educators, instructors of online courses emphasize. And uh, I'm not uh, trying to emphasize these things. You're probably aware of these skills uh, very, very well. So I just wanted to show you how most online educators or instructors focus on these particular skills, on the development of these particular skills. So with that in mind, I'll take you to a very different uh, you know, world uh, to, I mean, where we can approach the same idea, the same thing from a very different perspective. So I'll do that quickly. But before that, let me tell you how I have structured this particular session. So I have uh, divided this into four distinct parts. I'll start with the neuroscience of learning. I'll be focusing on a very recent development, which offers wonderful insights into the world of learning, not only face-to-face -face learning, but also online learning. So the neuroscience of learning, and then I'll be moving to neuroeducation, and then I'll take you to mirror neurons and e-learning, the connection between mirror neurons and e-learning. I don't exactly know whether you're familiar with the idea of mirror neurons or not, but I'll be making you familiar. It's very, very easy for you to understand. We all, in fact, experience mirror neuroning every now and then. And then uh, there's a very close connection between mirror neurons and e-learning. I'll be bringing that out. And then finally, uh, to something that is very, very important, especially in our times, because most often we do not focus on this particular aspect. So uh, it's, it's a kind of rat race in which everybody is concerned about learning. How much have you learned? How much 
my learners, my participants have learned. I'm going to test. I'm going to assess or evaluate the learning quotient of my my participants, my learners. So everybody is focusing on learning. So uh, I just wanted to flip it. And I, I also want you to take a, a close look at this particular aspect because it's very, very interesting. That is unlearning. Are we focusing on unlearning or we have been focusing on learning only? So what if we focus, we begin to focus on unlearning? Will it lead to the right kind of learning, especially online learning or not? So that's the fourth thing I'm going to do. Uh, today. So let's uh, start with the first segment. Uh, why is it, I mean, uh, why neuroscience of learning? Um, until very recently, people did not think about the connection between neuroscience and learning. People thought it's all about uh, um, human behavior. People focused on the behavioral aspects of learning. And that's, that's the reason why most learning theories tend to move towards, invariably, uh, towards the behavioral aspects of learning. But uh, some recent developments, some recent uh, studies have, in fact, uh, compelled us to uh, take our eyes towards this particular aspect of learning that we call neuroscience of learning. So neuroscience of learning is uh, quite popular now, but why is it so? Why is it so very popular? So uh, we all know that it's an emerging field. So it, it presents wonderful opportunities, opportunities in the sense that it helps us develop greater insights into the workings of the human brain and its connection with learning. So that way, whenever I design, whenever I develop a certain kind of content for my face-to-face -face classroom or even for my online uh, you know, courses, I can focus, I can take into account those insights, which will help me design courses in such a manner so that it can promptly uh, attract the attention of my participants because, because it will have uh, a neuroscientific aspect or element in it. So that way it's, it's going to help me. But at the same time, the neuroscience of learning has certain challenges as well. Like any, any other field, it has its own discontents, its challenges as well. So we need to take care of those challenges so that we do not fall into the trap that is called the neuroscience of learning because too much of any field can actually spell problems for the, the tutors, the educators. So, uh, the field has both opportunities and challenges. We need to understand those opportunities and challenges well so that we can quickly understand how we can move about it. And then uh, it also provides us means to develop a common language which can bridge educators, psychologists, and neuroscientists. So until, until very recently, uh, educators and psychologists worked in close connection, worked in close association with each other. But now uh, we can develop a common language among educators, psychologists, and neuroscientists as well. So that way neuroscience can help us understand the process of learning. And this, this field that is the neuroscience of learning is also very popularly known as neuroeducation or uh, educational neuroscience. So neuroeducation in fact investigates uh, some of the processes involved in learning to become literate and numerate. Because these, these are the two very important skills that every learning environment or every learning process takes into account whether somebody becomes literate and numerate or not. So, so that, is, that is how uh, we move about it. So Dr. Dr. Jenna, uh, is it okay? I mean, uh, am I clear? Absolutely fine, sir. Do I sound? Okay, okay. I need to check uh, at intervals. 
So that's that's the reason why uh, this field of neuroeducation is so very uh, popular. So that's one big reason why I encourage uh, all those educators or aspiring educators, developers of uh, online content or content for distance learning to explore this particular field so that you can enrich your your you know uh, content development experience or content development processes and then we come to the final thing that is uh, the neuroscience of learning explores the learning to learn the learning to learn aspect of learning cognitive control because there's something called brain training or cognitive training which is very very important because with cognitive training sessions or modules we can in fact change the behavior of our learners and um, several uh, research uh, studies have established the fact that we can in fact change the behavioral the learning behaviors or the learning behavioral patterns of our learners with cognitive training so therefore cognitive control is very very important and the flexibility uh, that's that's the reason why i call it unlearning okay so people generally uh, do not like the idea of unlearning because we have grown up with the idea of learning not unlearning so every time uh, we come across something uh, that contradicts with whatever we have learned whatever we have memorized and stored in the brain we find it challenging and in order to overcome that challenge we need to develop some kind of flexibility so neuroscience of learning tells us how to make this brain flexible so that we can prepare us for unlearning activities and then motivation as well and social and emotional experiences you all know that these days educators and um, you know uh, educational theorists are focusing a lot on social learning activities or social learning experiences. So does your learning translate or transfer into real life or social situations or not? And if it actually does, how do you behave? How do you react in such situations? So that's why there's, there's a lot of emphasis on social learning experiences which also happens to be an emotional experience as well. Because in the absence of this emotional experience, learning has to be an emotional experience as well. In the absence of that, learning will not happen. It will not take place. So all that will happen is a kind of memory storage or information storage. So there'll be no learning which, which can translate into some kind of action. So that will not happen. So that's the reason why the neuroscience of learning is one such emerging field which offers wonderful opportunities or insights into the very idea of learning or learning to learn. So I encourage all of you to uh, explore this particular field. And that brings us to the idea of neuroeducation. So neuroeducation, uh, it begins with this particular idea that it's all about uh, nature and nurture. So uh, parents may have two uh, kids, two children. One of them is quick to learn. One of them is good at learning. The other is not. And poor fellow always bears the brunt of uh, the frustration of the parents, the anger of the parents. That happens. Why is it so? They grow up in the same environment, they get the same kind of amenities, yet one of the child or one of the children is quick to learning or good at learning, the other is not so good. So that's that's one big reason which explains that it's it's all about nature, how nature has formed us. So we have certain genetic uh, dispositions, biological dispositions that actually uh, creates this difference in learning behaviors among children. And at the same time, it's about nurture as well. So what kind of environment do we give to a person? It has been found 
on the basis of several uh, studies, it has been found that if we give the right kind of environment to somebody, if we give customized environment, tailor-made environment to somebody or some learners who uh, are genetically disposed as weak learners or slow learners, if we give them the right kind of environment, when I say environment, I do not mean the physical environment. I mean the psychological environment in which you actually grow. In physical environments, we do not grow. So the psychological environment that helps us grow, if we give them the right kind of environment, they show better learning curve. So nurture also plays a very, very important uh, role in the learning brain. So nature and nurture together determine the learning brain, decide how the learning brain will behave. So neuroeducation focuses on this particular combination and uh, customizing this combination. So it's a very interesting uh, concept. We all know that the brain is plastic in nature. So this is called neuroplasticity. Plastic in the sense that it is very, very flexible. The brain has this flexibility embedded in it. But the problem is, as we begin to learn, or as we prepare our learners, as, as we uh, you know, take our learners through learning experiences, this particular neuroplasticity hardens or gets hardened, and it doesn't remain flexible anymore. So that's, that's the reason why most often the kind of uh, content, the kind of learning environments that we offer or present to our learners, they generally kill this particular ability of the brain. So neuroeducation focuses on not on this particular uh, ability of the brain, that is neuroplasticity. So our brain has this natural ability to adapt uh, to a variety of conditions or situations. So when that happens, the brain uh, can actually behave in a very flexible manner. But the kind of learning environments that uh, we expose our learners to, they are taught this particular activity, this particular ability. And this, this particular ability uh, gets hardened gradually and the flexibility is lost. And when this happens, learning becomes the only thing. Unlearning doesn't happen. And when unlearning doesn't happen, the, the brain uh, doesn't achieve the right kind of uh, higher order thinking level. So that's, that's uh, one big reason why. I mean, uh, I can tell you from my experiences at uh, IIT, uh, whenever we meet uh, students in the classroom and whenever we throw certain languages, uh, language challenges uh, uh, to them, uh, they respond uh, uh, in, a, in a similar manner. Uh, they respond in a manner as if uh, uh, they have trained uh, or they have been trained in the same uh, manner. They have been framed in the same manner. There's no creativity, there's no difference, there is, uh, uh, you know, there's no problem solving attitude. You will not see that, you will not see any originality. So why is it so that when we have access to all the information in this world, when we are so rich information wise, we still lack originality. So originality is a big challenge in our times, higher order thinking, um, you know, problem solving skills, decision making skills. So why is it so that uh, students generally lack this particular ability? Because of this particular thing, neuroplasticity is lost because they have been trained in such a manner and in such an environment that the flexibility is lost. For example, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, present a few simple examples, like how often uh, teachers, uh, you know, throw um, engaging questions to students in the classroom. 
for example, a mathematician, a mathematician comes and writes a mathematical equation, a mathematical problem on the blackboard, and then asks the students to solve that. It's just a mathematical problem on the blackboard with lots of uh, numbers and signs. But how often do you find uh, a mathematics instructor, educator, you know, throw certain social, real life problems to the students? Instead of writing something on the blackboard or these equations on the blackboard, how often do you find a mathematics teacher, you know, read out a story and then ask the student to find out the problem, the solution to the mathematical problem in that story? So that doesn't happen. And that's, that's one big reason why uh, there is no creativity. You're not engaged creatively. So neuroplasticity is lost. So whenever we develop online content or distance learning content, it's very important that we try to uh, engage the participants in such a manner so that the neuroplasticity element is either restored or it gets uh, enough food to work on. And it's, it's never hardened. So that's why neuroeducation focuses a lot on neuroplasticity. So this is, this is also a very, very interesting proposition. And uh, I, I uh, would like to say that uh, we do not have any conclusive evidence to establish this particular because uh, a research uh, or several researches are being conducted into this particular aspect of neuroeducation because the brain actually selects things on the basis of this uh, prediction error. We call this prediction error. Okay, so if I can predict success, I'll definitely go for that. If I cannot predict success, I, I generally do not go for that. Uh, one simple example may be, uh, you might have uh, noticed that a lot of uh, students, a lot of parents, in fact, and even students, they show a great amount of interest in going to Kota, Rajasthan, and joining uh, a coaching institute there. It may be Bansal, it may be any other, Allen, any, any other. There are several of them. So they join those uh, coaching institute and then they, they spend some time there. I know they pass through a lot of hardships. Okay, yet they decide to go there. A lot of people show that interest. And especially those who can afford, they generally show that uh, interest and then they, they go there. So why is it so? Because the brain can predict that your chances of getting through an IIT or NIT or triple uh, IT uh, gets enhanced the moment you, you are there. So the brain actually predicts, or determines or behaves on the basis of this prediction error. So the brain uh, takes up things that a certain learner finds to be extremely useful. So there are two elements. One is the expectation level and the other is the uncertainty level. If there is an element of uncertainty, the brain will not generally go for it. The reason is we generally, uh, uh, we are genetically designed to be in the safe mode, not in the survival mode. Because whenever we are in the safe mode, we, uh, we do not face any challenges from outside. So, and then this dopamine, you know, oxytocin, all these uh, uh, feel good hormones get secreted and we feel good, absolutely. And the moment we find ourselves in the survival mode, cortisol, the, the stress hormone gets secreted and then we, we feel disturbed, we feel anxious and uh, it may happen that we also feel depressed at times. So that's, that's the reason why we always want to be in the safe mode. So the brain always finds itself in the safe mode by following these two rules, expectation and uncertainty. So, so whenever we design courses, if we give enough reason to a learner that this particular course is going to help the learner in some way or the other, then the learner's brain will definitely expect that particular value 
that, that particular result from that particular content or course, and the learner will feel like getting associated with it. So it's, it's all about you know, working on these two important elements. So that's the reason why neuroeducation focuses a lot on this particular aspect. This is again a very, very interesting um, phenomenon associated with um, the, the neuroscience of learning. That is, uh, the brain has certain mechanisms which uh, uh, help us, uh, you know, uh, in self control and self regulation. So when it comes to uh, learning behavior, uh, which uh, was taken care of by psychology until now, is now being taken care of neuroscience. And it, it's offering wonderful insights into this particular aspect of it, that is learning behavior. So why, why do some uh, people drop out from online courses, from MOOCs? Uh, this particular aspect can help us understand this type of behavior because uh, the brain has certain mechanisms for self-regulation, self-control. So when, when uh, I regulate myself, then I'll be associated with one particular thing because it, it will be followed by my expectation. So once I expect something valuable from a course, I will feel like getting associated with it. So when that happens, it should not lead to any dropout, but it's leading to dropouts. So the gap that exists between this expectation level and the dropout point can be filled by this particular study, the brain mechanism for self-regulation. Why I cannot regulate myself, why I cannot you know, keep myself motivated for longer duration, for three months, for six months, so that I can complete this particular course and then move on for something else. So, so neuroeducation, in fact, focuses on these very important aspects of learning. And then we all know that education is one sort of the most powerful forms of uh, cognitive enhancement. There are various ways uh, uh, people are achieving cognitive enhancement. We all know that there are certain artificial or uh, artificially induced uh, methods or ways through which people are achieving cognitive enhancement. But we all know that education is the most powerful form of cognitive enhancement. Therefore, learning is called a cognitive enhancer. It's a cognitive enhancer. And so that's the reason why Neuroeducation focuses a lot on this particular aspect of learning, that is cognitive enhancement. So I'll be taking you to that particular thing uh, in a while. So that's exactly uh, when we need to understand the importance, the role of mirror neurons. So we have mirror neurons here, right at the prefrontal cortex of our brain, because the prefrontal cortex is the executive center of our brain. So uh, this particular executive center helps us perform a lot of executive activities, including decision-making, problem solving, you know, relationship building, interpersonal uh, skills, a lot of things. So this is one of the most important centers. And that's, that's the reason why most people, you know, uh, keep touching this particular, keep pointing towards this particular part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. And that's exactly where mirror neurons are located. You might have seen sometimes uh, uh, you, you go to watch a movie or you're watching a movie and suddenly you feel like you are acting. You are behaving in a manner uh, in which a certain character in that movie is behaving. So why does that happen? Why do we behave in that manner? It's because of the mirror neurons. They're called mirror neurons because the same kind of neurons get activated or fired when we observe a certain type of activity being performed by others. So let's take a look at this uh, uh, GIF. 
you can see the father is showing you know, the knuckles to the child. In the beginning, the child is not following, but soon the child also replicates the same behavior, the same type of action. Okay, you can see that very well. Is that visible to you, uh, Dr. Jena? Can you yes. please confirm? Yes, it is visible, sir. Yes. So I just want you to uh, take a close look at this particular, uh, you know, GIF. See, first the father does it. Now the child does it. So why does the child does it? And how? What makes the child do it? Because the child doesn't understand. The child is so young that it cannot understand what's happening. What is the meaning of those those two uh, knuckles. The child doesn't understand that, yet the child replicates that particular action. So there's a classic example of mirror neurons. So you do not have to think about it. Mirror neurons get activated. The moment you observe somebody performing a certain action, your mirror neurons are activated when you're encouraged to perform or you're encouraged to take a close look at that particular action. You, your mirror neurons get activated. And when that happens, you also replicate, you imitate the same action. So that's why mirror, understanding mirror neurons is very, very important for all the educators because it will help us understand the learning behaviors of our learners. Because if our learners can observe a certain type of activity which is being performed by the instructor or the educator, either directly or through some kind of content. I don't say that you have to act in some way or the other every now and then. You can create content which will engage the learner by firing the mirror neurons. So that's why it's very, very important. And what is the mechanism? This is the mechanism. You can see in, in the first image, on your left, you can see a monkey holding a banana. So that means it's performing a certain action. It's got a reward, that's the banana. So the monkey is happy now and the mirror neuron is fired because it has performed a certain action. The monkey is happy. The monkey has performed a certain action. It has the banana. So the mirror neuron gets fired from the prefrontal cortex of the monkey. In the second image, you can see that the monkey is not holding any banana in its hand. Instead, a person, a human is holding a banana right in front of the monkey. The monkey is observing that. And at the same time, the monkey feels as if it's holding the banana. It's performing that particular action. Because there are certain actions that we like to imitate. For example, um, we, we may not uh, uh, criticize a teacher we do not like, but when somebody else does that, we feel as if we are doing that because the same mirror neuron is activated. Yes, I also wanted to say that. I always wanted to say that, but I couldn't say. I, I never had the courage to say that. Now that somebody has said that, I can identify with it. So that's exactly what we mean by uh, when we say, I, I cannot identify with this course. I cannot identify with that teacher. I cannot identify with that class. So this identifying with, the moment you identify with something, some action, some person, that means the mirror neurons are fired, they are activated, and you tend to perform the same action. So how does it help in online learning? So, I mean, just uh, for your information, that's uh, Rizzoletti, the Italian uh, neurophysiologist. He started, uh, I mean, he discovered uh, mirror neurons. So mirror neurons are actually, uh, I mean, they, they help us uh, understand how we learn through human interactions. And that's the reason why I focused on interpersonal um, you know, skills, abilities. So it's 
it's through human interactions that we learn a lot. And this is a very, very important one. When it comes to online learning or distance learning, this particular aspect goes missing because we do not uh, know how to uh, incorporate that human element in online courses, online programs. So human interactions play a very, very important role in learning because they fire mirror neurons. And that's one big reason why uh, in online uh, uh, courses, uh, people these days uh, are emphasizing the use of uh, jam boards, um, even breakout rooms and uh, discussion forums and a variety of other things. So uh, that's uh, uh, how I'll quickly take you through. This particular aspect is very, very important. Uh, showing, observing, and replicating behavior is the most basic form of learning. So if I can show something, I can replicate that behavior. So therefore, in online learning, uh, it's very important that we show. When I say we show, I do not mean that we'll, we'll end up showing visuals only. No, they may not be visuals. They may be text as well. But we need to create an image in the mind of the learners so that they can quickly follow that. They can replicate so that they can observe and replicate. So that's why it's very, very important. And, and because of this as well, I'll quickly take you through uh, this slide so that we can go to the last slide quickly. Now that brings us to the idea of unlearning. So I have used a very famous quote by Alvin Toffler, the American futurist. So uh, look at the last segment, who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So there is an emphasis on unlearning. So we live in the era of unlearning. It's not an era of learning. It's an era of unlearning. For example, moving from the face-to-face -face mode to the online mode, why is it so that most students today do not like the idea of online learning? Because of this, because they cannot unlearn. And that's, that's the reason why. But unlearning is a wonderful, wonderful uh, strategy since we do not have much time. But I would like uh, you to explore this particular strategy. That is, do not focus on learning, focus on unlearning. If you can you know, uh, train a student in the unlearning skill, that means you are helping the student learn a lot of things. So unlearning is very important. It's far more important than learning. So uh, it's, it's a process through which we actually break down the origins of our thoughts. As I told you, we always like to be in the safe mode. We do not like to be in the survival mode. That means if I have an idea in my mind, you might have seen how young children fight with their parents. They say, no. My teacher, my class teacher has said so. It cannot be wrong because, because the child is not ready to unlearn. The parent is saying something. Okay, so I generally find it a very difficult task when I teach my students how to write uh, formal or business letters at a higher level. So they always return to their school level writings and they say, no, no, this is how we learned how to write a letter during our school days. So they're not ready to unlearn because unlearning is a very difficult activity. It's not an easy task because you need to change your attitude, your behaviors, your biases, prejudices, feelings, your thoughts. You need to go for a complete overhauling of the mind, but it's not an impossible task. We can always do that. We can encourage unlearning. So these are some of the questions that we need to ask ourselves if I have to engage in unlearning activities. So where do these beliefs come from? Uh, do these support my mental health? Or for that matter, okay, anything for that matter. Uh, is this in alignment with the life that I want? Various things. So these are some of the questions. I don't say that these are the, the only questions. You need to ask questions to yourself, okay? And then uh, you, you can, in fact, 
engage in the act of unlearning. So if unlearning doesn't happen, no new learning will happen. I am reminded of a very famous quote by uh, Alfred Tennyson, um, a 19th century English poet, who once said that uh, the old order changes, yielding place to the new, and God fulfills himself in many ways, lest one good custom should corrupt the world. However good that custom may be, that practice may be, if it is not changed, it's going to corrupt the world. Corrupt in the sense that it will kill plasticity, flexibility, neuroplasticity, and creativity. So therefore, it's very, very important that we focus on unlearning activities. So that is how we uh, come to uh, this particular the, the final slide. Unlearning is going to help you spark your creativity. See the same thing from a different perspective. So this perspective shift will always help you, you know, uh, enrich your learning experience. And then you can grow and you can connect uh, in a more authentic way with yourself. And then you can become more and more curious. So unlearning is one such activity that uh, we can focus on uh, rather than focusing a lot on learning. So unlearning. For example, at the end of uh, uh, my course, I generally ask myself how much I helped my students unlearn their previous, uh, previous knowledge or information and learn something new. So that is, that is uh, how we, we can approach the whole thing. So that brings us to the end of uh, this session. Uh, these are some of the sources from which uh, I have uh, used my, my material. I have taken the material for this session, for this presentation. You can also explore these uh, sources uh, for further uh, uh, information about this particular area. So thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to me. I'm open to questions there. Sir, we have got a lot of questions. And to begin with, let's uh, go with the first question. The first question is, what is the difference between online learning, blended learning, and e-learning? Actually, these are series of questions from various okay, participants. Okay. And I have... Oh, most most yeah. often they are used. Blended learning is slightly different. Uh, I mean... It's it's a method. It's a, it's a strategy that can used uh, that can be used in online learning as well. So, blended learning or uh, uh, flip uh, learning, for example, um, you record your lecture and share it with your students uh, prior to a certain class, and you ask your students to watch that video and take their notes. So, when they come to the class, you do not teach them again. You just hold a discussion. You create a thread and then hold a discussion. So flip classrooms or flip learning are, are also very, very popular these days. Uh, but that requires a combination of both face-to-face uh, -face and uh, uh, away from the classroom uh, activities. So blended learning, we all, we all know that. I mean, we, we blend uh, technology into um, the content creation process and the learning process uh, as well. Uh, so, e-learning, uh, e is uh, one of the most uh, uh, popular initials in the past few decades. We all know that. So, we add e to uh, anything that gives us uh, an idea of a virtual thing. So, e-learning, uh, that means learning electronically uh, or online learning. Of course, uh, for online learning, you need a di digital platform. Um, you need to learn electronically. Uh, so they, they are uh, synonymous with each other. Uh, for example, e-learning and online learning, virtual learning, you're not there, you're learning. So virtual um, gives you a sense of uh, virtuality, in fact. So there's a kind of virtual meeting that we are into right now. Uh, so you call them by any, any name, uh, but... Uh, they, it's, they remain the same. It's, it's all about uh, innovating. For example, you have a certain platform. 
you may use uh, Google uh, Meet, you may use Microsoft Teams, irrespective of the platform that you use. If you know how to use it, because you are a unique individual. So the moment you use that platform, it's completely up to you to innovate. So it's more about innovating rather than using the uh, available platforms or available digital tools. So it's more about innovating. You may not have uh, the right kind of digital tools, but if you're innovative, you can always uh, do that. You can always do something new. So the next question is, what are the key factors for making online learning effective? Well, uh, I mean, if I have to respond to this uh, query uh, from the perspective of uh, educators or developers or instructors, you know, uh, as I told you, I just wanted you to take a look at, uh, I mean, a close look at how neuroscience can help us a lot uh, in devising uh, new ways or methods uh, to create a lot of interest in our online learners. So there are two problems that, that I generally uh, come across when it comes to online uh, uh, courses or MOOCs. The first is, I mean, heterogeneity is a wonderful thing. I mean, that is at the very uh, root of uh, the whole idea of MOOC. It's massive. So it crosses the boundaries. It has to be massive. So, but uh, for the sake of massivity, uh, we are missing that homogeneity element, which is very, very important. Because when I design something, in order to make it focused, I, I need a homogeneous group. So if, if I have five students who are expecting the same kind of result, from a certain interaction, it will be easy for me and it, it will, of course, uh, give me an added advantage to make them engage in the process. But if I get two more students who do not expect that much or anything from that interaction or discussion, it will be difficult for me to retain them. So therefore, I mean, I, I always uh, favor homogeneous MOOCs, for example, this particular MOOC that is Academic Counseling for ODL is of course homogeneous because it will definitely bring in people who are focusing on those areas or those aspects only. For example, if I, if I develop a life skills MOOC, it cannot be homogeneous, it has to be heterogeneous. I cannot stop uh, people of all age to come and join that course, but that will make it difficult because uh, learning abilities and learning levels differ uh, according to age. So we, we know that habit uh, learning uh, becomes uh, a problem. So, so that's, that's uh, the thing. So all I have to do is to engage my learners. I mean, an easier way to find a homogeneous group. So create homogeneous MOOCs to engage the learners. So the number of participants may be a little less. It may not be massive in that sense, but the impact will be better. Yes, sir, you are absolutely right. And we have also witnessed the same in the first cycle of the program. So uh, it is actually a concentrated group that is actively engaged in learning and helping each other to understand uh, various aspects of open and distance learning. So the next question is, from design perspective, what are the challenges of ODL and online learning? There are several challenges. As I told you, I mean, uh, finding the right kind of learners. Because uh, when it comes to ODL, um, it's almost like, uh, you know, fighting an invisible enemy. You do not know your enemy and you're fighting you, you uh, have an invisible challenge. So that makes it extremely difficult for you. So uh, the very idea and very, very ambitious. So we need to do away with that ambition uh, because uh, um, 
MOOCs make you uh, venture into, um, you know, mysterious worlds, bizarre uh, worlds. And that's, that's the reason why we find uh, a list of courses that uh, we, we cannot even uh, expect, we cannot even imagine to be. So, so that makes it absolutely ambitious. So we need to cut down on that ambition first so that we can design courses which will engage our learners. So I, I generally go for homogeneous uh, and designing courses with the help of which I can engage my learners. I can find a certain group of learners and I can give them a certain deliverable or a few deliverables. That means at the end of that course, they will take home these things. And it has to be a homogeneous group. So if I design uh, a course, that, that's one aspect of it. And the second uh, aspect is I need to innovate. I need to give them uh, enough reason to engage themselves with the content. I mean, it, it cannot be uh, a read-only content, which most MOOCs uh, generally suffer from. We generally uh, read uh, from the content and then we end up reading out the content and explaining that content to the, the learners. So instead of doing that, if, if we can you know, incorporate, um, this is a very, very uh, popular idea these days, gamification. Um, I can recall uh, a wonderful app that is Duolingo. I don't exactly know whether you're familiar with Duolingo or not. With the help of Duolingo, you can learn various languages. So it's a language, uh, foreign language learning app. So Duolingo uh, has incorporated a gamification strategy. So gamification is turning out to be a very, um, a very powerful um, medium, a very powerful method with the help of which we can engage our learners. So uh, designers can think of uh, incorporating gamification as well. So make it a game, uh, offer them challenges. For example, there are certain subjects that uh, cannot enjoy this privilege, but when it comes to science, we can always uh, engage uh, in gamification activities. So I, I, I can ask uh, the participants to watch a video by Eric uh, Mazur. Uh, you can watch that video, um, a Harvard uh, professor of physics. So how he talks about uh, uh, his uh, physics teaching experience. So how he in fact uh, flipped the very idea of teaching physics. So you can do that. So the next question is based on learning, based on learning skills, what are the difference between thinking skills and social skills. Okay, uh, thinking skills and social skills, All right? So you know when it comes to thinking, I mean uh, thinking skills and even higher order thinking skills as well. Uh, so you might have uh, heard uh, how the entire world is uh, talking about uh, uh, emotional intelligence, uh, creativity. Um, and then creative thinking. Uh, for a long, long time, the world uh, talked about critical thinking. And then they suddenly stopped talking about critical thinking and started talking about creative thinking. So, and they also started talking about a, a combination of critical thinking and creative thinking as well. So, of course, I mean, thinking skills are very important too, whether it's uh, critical or creative thinking, because I, I don't know uh, why there is such a distinction between creative and critical thinking. So it's, it's, at times it becomes extremely difficult for someone to separate and them. So thinking is thinking. I mean, it, it might be uh, owing to the left uh, right brain dichotomy, uh, which the world believed in for a long, long time. Now that dichotomy has been resolved. And we say that it's, it's all about uh, a combination of the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. It's not about uh, one side or the other side. So when it comes to 
emotional intelligence, we, we generally uh, focus on these two aspects as well. I mean, emotional intelligence uh, is a wonderful tool. We all know that. We can understand um, the emotional uh, status or the state of somebody quickly. But at the same time, if I uh, approach the whole idea through critical thinking, that means I learn how to, um, you know, you know or exploit somebody's emotional state as well. So emotional intelligence can turn out to be a weapon, a tool with the help of which we can exploit people and people have been doing that. So when it comes to uh, thinking uh, skills, so we need to uh, approach the whole idea through a combination of critical and creative thinking. So critical thinking will allow us to evaluate that particular thing and creative thinking will allow us to innovate. So evaluate and innovate go together. So for example, if I say it has a problem, so that doesn't solve the problem. The moment I say the teacher doesn't teach well, that means I have to help the teacher teach well. I have to offer a way. So finding a problem um, may be, uh, because of your critical thinking skills. But finding a solution will definitely uh, be because of your creative thinking skills. You, you're offering a solution. So this is a solution, would you try it? So that's it. So when it comes to thinking skills and social skills, of course, I mean, um, we, we do not live in isolation. We live in a society in which uh, we interact with people. And then uh, when it comes to interacting with people, we're actually not exchanging or sharing information only. We are in fact uh, taking up social issues, issues that are related to uh, society, that are related to our social being or social existence. And then we're trying to find problem, I mean, solutions to those problems as well. So I'm reminded of a wonderful uh, thing which happened uh, during the first phase of this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so, uh, social distancing. So social distancing turned out to be um, uh, a bad phrase for a country like India. It actually resulted in social ostracization. It led to social distancing in, in the other sense. So then, then uh, people uh, talked about you know, physical distancing, how to distance uh, oneself physically, not socially. So, so therefore, it's very, very important that these social skills and thinking skills are uh, integrated in such a manner uh, so that uh, uh, we, we, we can replicate our learning in social situations. Thank you, sir. Sir, we have more than 30 questions, but we, okay. we have already run out of time. So there are two critical questions, which uh, I think we need to spend some time on uh, discussing this. Uh, one is, uh, it is a question from Dr. Nadim uh, from CTE Bhopal. Uh, he's asking, how can we foster originality in teaching learning process? Then the second question uh, is regarding developing MOOCs in uh, areas like life sciences, biochemistry. So how, how about, you know, providing hands-on laboratory experience through MOOCs, is it possible, or online learning? Your quick response, please. Yeah, also, by responding to the first question, how to maintain originality in online uh, teaching and learning. Okay, uh, so that's, that's of course a very interesting question because I've been studying uh, MOOCs for quite some time uh, because once the MOOC uh, has been designed and developed, it hardly goes through the review lens. Uh, when I say review lens, I mean, uh, is it reviewed and is it uh, modified uh, after a certain cycle, after a certain period? That doesn't generally happen. So once a MOOC becomes a big hit, uh, hugely popular, people tend to think that that MOOC has all the ingredients to attract uh, the participants. Okay, that may not be the case because... Uh, so we need to constantly uh, evaluate. We need to constantly, you know, help the MOOC evolve through the timeline. So originality is uh, not about, uh, 
you know, being original in your first attempt or being innovative in your first attempt. You are innovative, you are original in your first attempt. But after a certain time, that originality will become stale. Your, your innovativeness will become stale because it will, no, uh, it will not be innovative anymore. So innovation is an ever evolving process. You need to innovate. For example, if I have to teach the same lesson to different batches, semester after semester, I have to do something new, something different. I cannot depend, and we generally do that. Those, especially those educators who take the teaching uh, business seriously, they do that. They generally do so. And that's, that's a wonderful approach. But when it comes to online content, that, that doesn't generally happen. So we need to think about it. We need to you know, take back the same uh, content, online content, review it, modify it, re-record it, give some other examples. You may find something more interesting after uh, time elapses. So you can think of incorporating those things. So when it comes to online teaching and learning, this is one uh, uh, very important area that we need to address. For example, I have also seen uh, teachers uh, uh, who get their lectures recorded and then especially the pandemic uh, made them do so. They got their lectures recorded. Now we are into the second semester uh, after the pandemic. So very soon we'll be entering the third semester in the online mode. So they are not reviewing, they're not changing. So that is uh, the kind of slackness which sets in when it comes to online content creation. We, we don't generally uh, go for a modification. So we can do that in order to retain the originality and innovativeness of online teaching. And Because uh, if you run a certain MOOC for a cycle, and if you give certain assignments to your students, you need to change the assignments. You need to modify the assignments so that you can engage the next batch of students. Otherwise, the same assignments will become stale in time to come. So, so that, that's about assignments. But when it comes to content, you can also think of recreating the content. So that is, that is how we can maintain. When it comes to creating MOOCs for those uh, subjects or disciplines in which uh, a hands-on uh, practical experience is also required is Dr. Nadim is absolutely right when he said that it cannot replace the face-to-face -face mode. It cannot replace. But there are certain applications like the virtual lab is doing well. So the virtual lab offers uh, hands-on uh, practical experiences uh, to or uh, virtual practical experiences to students to uh, do so. Uh, but uh, that can uh, actually be taken care of by giving a certain mind boggling or engaging assignments to students who can perform it on their own. For example, group activities in which they can discuss, they can engage, they, the, the tutor, the educator can offer uh, a problem-based uh, uh, question uh, which requires the students to develop a model. So they, they, they can do so. Just to check uh, whether they have been able to understand uh, the phenomenon, the concepts well or not. Otherwise, uh, until now, there is no such uh, uh, substitute to face-to-face -face practical experience. Thank you, sir. I request all the participants to kindly put the unanswered questions in the discussion forum so that we take up the questions and we initiate our discussion immediately after this lecture. Thank you, Dr. Misra, for making this session interesting and interactive. It was like a poetry, very soothing at the same time. It has made us introspect and critically analyze our roles as educators and academics. We have learned to unlearn in this session, if not anything else. Dear participants, we, part we appreciate your active involvement and passion towards learning. All of you are adding tremendous value to this course. And I can never thank you enough for that. 
please keep sharing your thoughts, queries, and feedback with us. We have the next live session on the coming Wednesday, that is on 5th May from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. as per Indian Standard Time. Thank you once again. I'm privileged to be the moderator of this session. I once again thank Dr. Misra for his excellent delivery. I also thank my esteemed colleague, Mr. Asim Patel and Subhra Saraf from Odisha State Open University and Dr. Panigrahi from SEMCA for their invaluable contribution and extensive support. Thank you all. This is the official announcement that the session has come to an end. You may thank please you so disengage from the platform. Thank you so much.